Lafcadio O'Hearn wrote, No man can possibly know what life means, what the world means, what anything means, until he has had a child and loves it. And then the whole universe changes, and nothing will ever again seem exactly as it seemed before. Hello once again, I'm Don Jackson. Someone once said, I never understood the obstacles my father faced until I became one. I love my father's memory now more than ever. Whether he's here in the flesh or only in spirit, it's a father's life we honor with the heartbeat of the Internet. According to the book Fathers, edited by Alexandra Toll, the last Sharifian emperor of Morocco, Moulay Ishmael, who lived between 1627 and 1727, known as the Bloodthirsty, was reputed to have fathered a total of 548 sons and 340 daughters. End quote. I'd like to know when he had time to earn the nickname the bloodthirsty. It's been said that your life changes completely when you become a father. From that day forward, you will always be a parent, no matter what happens throughout the rest of your life. I became a father late in life. For a time, I believed that fatherhood would elude me, that I'd never get a chance to experience what being a father was all about. I would have to be only an observer on the experiences my friends talked about. Eventually, though, it was my turn, and my life changed for the better. My heart grew twice its size for all the love I had for my firstborn. I would have been happy having just one child, but fate decided to reward my patience with two children. The space in my heart doubled in size again. I don't think it matters how many children life blesses you with. Your heart automatically makes room to encompass all the love you have for each one. There is never a danger that a time will come when you have no more room in your heart. That's one of the incredible mysteries of the human heart. James Douglas wrote, We think of father as an old or at least a middle-aged man. The astounding truth is, that most fathers are young men and that they make their greatest sacrifices in their youth. I never meet a young man in a public park on Sunday morning wheeling his first baby in a perambulator without feeling an ache of reverence. Some fathers may have been a little reluctant at first to start a family. The awesome, long-term responsibility involved can be daunting to a young man just starting out in his career. It was different in my father's day, though. After the Second World War, there was a time of prosperity. Men and women returned home to find a job, buy a house, and start a family. In those days, when you began a career, it was possible to stay in one job for your entire working life until retirement. Still reeling from a bruised economy, young people might have many careers or jobs today. No longer does it seem possible to stay in one occupation or in one company till retirement. And even if you do, you'll be more than likely to need a job following your departure. But an uncertain economy should not be a roadblock to beginning a family. You may need to put it on hold temporarily, but a family can be the anchor that stabilizes your life during tough times. Myron Brenton said, To be sure, working, that is, earning a living, is one aspect of fathering. It's one means that the father has of extending protection to his family, but it's just one. If he concentrates on this to the exclusion of other aspects, it becomes not a form of fathering, but 
an escape. William Feather wrote, Setting a good example for your children takes all the fun out of middle age. A father has so much to teach his family and lessons to learn from them as well. For example, this one. There once was a little boy who had a bad temper. His father gave him a bag of nails and told him that every time he lost his temper, he must hammer a nail into the back of the fence. The first day, the boy had driven 37 nails into the fence. Over the next few weeks, as he learned to control his anger, the number of nails hammered daily gradually dwindled down. He discovered it was easier to hold his temper than to drive those nails into the fence. Finally, the day came when the boy didn't lose his temper at all. He told his father about it, and the father suggested that the boy now pull out one nail for each day that he was able to hold his temper. The days passed, and the young boy was finally able to tell his father that all the nails were gone. The father took his son by the hand and led him to the fence. He said, you've done well, son, but look at the holes in the fence. The fence will never be the same. When you say things in anger, they leave a scar just like this one. It won't matter how many times you say, I'm sorry, the wound is still there. A verbal wound is as bad as a physical one. That young boy learned a very valuable lesson that day about anger. Now, if we as adults could learn from that little boy's experience, maybe we wouldn't have to worry about trying to mend our own fences. We can learn a lot about life by listening to the lessons of this country's original inhabitants. Some native North American wisdom. Eagle Wings, Bama River Native American wisdom, and I quote, An old grandfather said to his grandson, who came to him with anger at a friend who had done him an injustice, Let me tell you a story. I too, at times, have felt a great hate for those who have taken so much with no sorrow for what they do. But hate wears you down and does not hurt your enemy. It is like taking poison and wishing your enemy would die. I have struggled with these feelings many times. He continued, It is as if there are two wolves inside me. One is good and does no harm. He lives in harmony with all around him and does not take offense when no offense was intended. He will only fight when it is right to do so and in the right way. But the other wolf, he is full of anger. The littlest thing will set him into a fit of temper. He fights everyone all the time for no reason. He cannot think because his anger and hate are so great. It is helpless anger, for his anger will change nothing. Sometimes it is hard to live with these two wolves inside me, for both of them try to dominate my spirit. The boy looked intently into his grandfather's eyes and asked, Which one wins, grandfather? The grandfather smiled and quietly said, The one I feed. If you had to think about the best portrayal of fathers on television, who would top your list? Back in the time of black and white TV, there was the stereotypical father portrayed in the series Father Knows Best and in the series My Three Sons. Society then liked the father wearing a shirt and tie and being comfortable in his suit even at home. I guess they felt it lent a certain credibility to the man of the house role he portrayed at the time. 
My favorite was always Tom Bosley, who played Mr. Cunningham on Happy Days. He was the cool dad that every father was trying to aspire to be at the time. He had to be cool, because even the Fonz liked him. The Fonz stood up to everybody, but he always backed down where Richie's father was concerned. Remember Mr. Brady on The Brady Bunch? Again, both TV fathers starting to loosen those restrictive neckties. At the other end of the scale was Carol O'Connor's Archie Bunker and his long-suffering wife, Edith, in the TV series, the hit TV series, All in the Family. We recently lost Gene Stapleton, who played Edith. I'm glad there was always the meathead around to keep Archie on his toes. Al Bundy was certainly no prize either. That series epitomized like father, like family. He only had himself to blame. Our animated favorites take fatherhood to a whole new level. The relative innocence and good-natured Fred Flintstone and George Jetson would eventually be replaced by Simpletons, Homer Simpson in The Simpsons, and Peter Griffin on Family Guy. Tony Soprano was transparent to his family, the tough love father in many ways, who would want to cross Tony at the best of times, certainly not his children. Do you know which TV father has really bothered me the most? The war hero, Nicholas Brody, who returned home to his wife and children in the hit TV series, Homeland. His duplicity that caused so much grief to the CIA's carry really got me worked up in the first season of the hit show. As times change, so does TV's portrayal of fatherhood. It's sometimes a good indicator of what's really going on in suburbia today. A 16th century proverb says it is a wise child that knows its own father. Richard Eyre from Utopia and Other Places, published by Bloomsbury, wrote, Our parents cast long shadows over our lives. When we grow up, we imagine we can walk in the sun free of them. We don't realize until it's too late that we have no choice in the matter. They're always ahead of us. We carry them within us all our lives, in the shape of our face, in the way we walk, in the sound of our own voice, and in our skin, our hair, our hands, our heart. We try all our lives to separate ourselves from them, and only when they are gone do we find we are indivisible. This is called When God Created Fathers by Irma Bombeck. When the good Lord was creating fathers, he started with a tall frame. A female angel nearby said, What kind of father is that? If you're going to make children so close to the ground, why have you put fathers up so high? You won't be able to shoot marbles without kneeling, tuck a child in bed without bending, or even kiss a child without a lot of stooping. God smiled and said, Yes, but if I make him child size, who would children have to look up to? Who would children have to look up to? And when God made a father's hands, they were large and sinewy. The angel shook her head sadly and said, Do you know what you're doing? Large hands are clumsy. They can't manage diaper pins, small buttons, rubber bands on ponytails, or even remove splinters caused by baseball bats. Again, God smiled and said, I know, but they're large and white empties from his pockets at the end of a day, yet small enough to cup a child's face. Then God molded long, slim legs and broad shoulders. The angel nearly had a heart attack. Boy, this is the end of the week, all right, she clucked. Do you realize you just made a father without a lap? How is he going to pull a child close to him without the kid falling between his legs? God smiled and said, a mother needs a lap. A father needs strong shoulders to pull a sled, balance a child on a bicycle, or hold a sleepy head on the way home from the circus. God was in the middle of creating two of the largest feet anyone had ever seen when the angel could not contain herself any longer. That's not fair. Do you honestly think those large boats are going to dig out of bed early in the morning when the baby cries? 
or walk through a small birthday party without crushing at least three of the guests. Again, God smiled and said, they'll work, you'll see. They'll support a child who wants to ride a horse to Banbury Cross or scare off mice at the summer cabin or display shoes that will be a challenge to fill. God worked throughout the night, giving the father few words, but a firm, authoritative voice and eyes that saw everything but remained calm and tolerant. Finally, almost as an afterthought, he added tears. Then he turned to the angel and said, Now, are you satisfied that he can love as much as a mother? The angel said nothing more. And finally, one last thought about the creation of a father. This is called, What Makes a Dad? Again, author unknown. God took the strength of a mountain, the majesty of a tree, the warmth of a summer sun, the calm of a quiet sea, the generous soul of nature, the comforting arm of night, the wisdom of the ages, the power of of the eagle's flight, the joy of a morning in spring, the faith of a mustard seed, the patience of eternity, the depth of a family's need. Then God combined these qualities when there was nothing more to add. He knew his masterpiece was complete, and so he called it Dad. You know, in conclusion, I think we have it all wrong. I've always believed that it's me as a father who should be the one to give a special gift on Father's Day. My father passed his values along to me through the years. I think it's a gift that should be passed on from one generation to the next. Good night, sweet dreams, and happy Father's Day. I'm Don Jackson.